The film is set in the north of Australia in 1919. Viewers are greeted by beautiful views of the continent in the setting sun. From a bird's eye view, we are shown the magical nature of the island. A small native is doused in a white liquid to become like his idol, Michael Jackson. The aboriginal child sneaks quietly through the lowlands, with a sharp spear in his hands. He hunts with his father and uncle, but the thrown spear frightens the prey and does not yield good results. His father tells him to watch the process, but not to interfere. After a long period of training, the little hunter will be able to finish animals on his own. The boy, whose name is Gutchik, sits with his uncle Braddock in the canyon. The older one teaches him ceremonial dancing. Returning to the tribe's camp, they encounter two black fugitives who are hiding from the police. The natives have killed on a cow at a local Christian mission outpost and must now hide from justice. Gutchik's father allows them to stay one night, but even that is too little. A police detachment has already caught up with the crooks. The servants of the law, led by Eddie's boyfriend, sneak up to the camp of the natives. From the high ground, on a cliff, they are covered by a comrade in arms, a former military sniper named Travis. The head of the local mission, a Catholic priest, has also arrived with them. The gritty guys walk to the natives' camp, where they indulge in simple native pleasures. Travis notices that two colleagues are plotting something wrong against the team. A quietly sneaking man, Eddie, stumbles upon the little gutchuk. The little native raises a violent scream, which provokes an attack by Baywara. The policeman shoots the warrior and a massacre ensues. Eddie is attacked by one outlaw, for which he is shot several times in the stomach. Travis sees through the telescopic sight as the other white men shoot unarmed natives, including women and children. One of the surviving women hides Gutchuk. She takes care of the baby by giving him a straw to breathe underwater. Once out on dry land, the woman becomes the victim of another target shot by a white settler. Descended from the cliffs, Travis cannot endure the senseless violence and cruelty. After several attempts to stop the shooter, he kills the first one, then finishes off the second wounded one with a spear. He notices a boy, hiding in the water, and takes him out. With him, the surviving lawmen return to the outpost, where the little aboriginal boy is given to the pastor's sister to raise. Eddie and Travis discuss what to tell Colonel Walter. The sniper is unwilling to hide what his partner does not. Meanwhile, the patriarch of the tribe, who lives on a separated cliff, sees alarmed birds in the sky. Thinking it a bad sign, he goes down and runs to his family along the fire that surrounds the sky in red. At the sight of the camp, he sees only the dead bodies of his vast family. Only Baywara remains alive, but slightly wounded. The old man embraces him and promises to heal him. A full 12 years pass. Travis the sniper is engaged in a God-pleasing occupation, shooting crocodiles for the good of the shoe industry. He is distracted from his useful work by a visit from Colonel Walter and his partner Eddie. The old man is fond of photography, striving to capture history for his descendants. The true purpose of the warrior's visit is different. They tell a former soldier about the natives. The natives have incarnated a gang, led by the Baywara, and are attacking outposts across the Australian front. The fearsome natives took all the livestock, burned the buildings, and hindered the white man's burden. The warriors were willing to turn a blind eye to the antics of the natives if they would not raise their hand against a superior race, specifically killing a white woman. Such a thing could not be tolerated and the authorities were ready to send in punitive units. When they started digging, it turned out that the leader of the gang was a superior Baywara, a survivor of the massacre 12 years ago. The incident could have been written off as pioneer difficulty if the bodies of the two white policemen had not contained the sniper bullets used only by Travis. In order not to draw unnecessary attention to the misdeeds of his subordinates, the colonel suggests that the sniper go with Eddie to eliminate the ringleader. It is easier for the shooter himself to shoot his former colleagues, but they dare to go to the meeting. One of the gang's raids is witnessed by a black kid. He says he is the nephew of the Baywara ringleader. Yeah, he turned out to be Gutchuk, who was given a different name. He still works at the outpost where he was raised. When the hero arrives there, Travis is told that he is the boy he once saved. Eddie, suspecting the boy of conspiring with the gang, threatens him, but Travis intervenes. The men shove and almost fight, but quickly disperse. Later, Gutchik has a private conversation with the shooter. He agrees that if he helps search the ringleader, Travis won't let him be summarily executed. The next morning, before moving out, the kid asks an old man to go to the gang to warn them. After a warning, the two of them and Travis get on their horses and set off. Such conditions do not please the colonel, and he gives the assignment to follow his former comrade to get the job done. For this purpose he is given another partner, a vicious mestizo, a half-breed who is hated and feared by all the locals. After waiting for the proper pause, Eddie and him go after the sniper. Travis and Gutchuk enjoy a walk through the beautiful and scenic landscape where all kinds of critters want to kill people. 
Finding traces of a still warm fire in a stone nook, the heroes decide to stop at an elevated pass. On the way, the young man explains that his name means hawk, and the birds in the sky look out for him. On the mountain, Travis teaches Gutchik the basics of martial arts. The first thing to do is to occupy the dominant altitude. Then he lets him practice shooting a rifle with a scope. The guy, though not on his first try, succeeds. In addition, the sniper notices Eddie following the trail from above, who realizes that the stakeout has failed. In camp, the sniper tells his companion that they were partners in the war, and that the other was the gunner. In the morning, Eddie prepares to move on, but suddenly notices that they are being sneaked up on. The Pathfinders split up under the pretext of taking a leak, realizing that a predatory gunman, Travis, is already looming in the crosshairs. Travis manages to sidestep the shooter and take aim with his revolver. Suddenly Gutchuk rises from the grass behind him. The kid takes aim at the half-breed, taking cover behind him from Eddie's gun. The stalemate is quickly resolved by Travis. He takes away the pursuer's weapons and tells them to go back to the colonel and not to see them again. After Travis sees off the scope, the wild bunch wars rise out of the grass and take him prisoner. The natives praise Gutchuk for a job well done. Gutchuk says he is a good man, but his fate will be decided by his elders, the lad's grandfather and Baywar's father. On the way, the lad spots a female warrior who, according to his uncle, is too wild to be anyone's wife. The sniper is kept in a remote cave. While the savages are discussing his fate, Gutchuk translates his grandfather's words to the white man. He wants to negotiate with him to try Baywara according to his own laws, not the laws of the colonists. For the sake of this, he is willing to go personally to negotiate with the colonels, leaving Baywara to oversee the economy of the camp. When they leave, they are met by a woman warrior, accusing them of coerdice and fear of changing the lives of the captives. After the woman's words, the patriarch does not change his mind. Soon, the native delegation arrives at the outpost. The colonel meets them on parade after performing ceremonial dances. The natives attack the right to judge their man according to their own laws, and the colonizers seek justice. The question of justice escalates when the grandfather asks the white old man to punish those responsible for the deaths of his family 12 years ago, which is legitimately refused. At this point, the attempt to resolve the matter peacefully ends. The natives leave while the colonizers prepare for a backup plan. Travis quietly gives his traitorous friend one of his rifles. The boy runs into two white men who want to rape a female warrior. Threatening them with his rifle, he tells them to let the woman go, after which she escapes. A third guy sneaks up behind him with a revolver, but does not have time to do anything. The woman warrior smashes his head in with a stick, continuing to pound his skull into a bloody mess. The others suffer a similar fate, one is bludgeoned, the other is shot, after which the natives go on to the gang. Eddie and his men follow their trail, finding the dead in the process. The young native argues with Baywara about tactics and strategy. The man doesn't like the fact that some young man is contradicting him. He aims his spear at him and almost pierces him, but is prevented by a bullet, aptly shot by Travis. The boy lies down on a hill, and aptly saves the native. The young man realizes who saved him and what it all means. A punitive squad, hearing a gunshot, sneaks up on the gang and opens fire. Gutchuk with his rifle lies behind a rock, occasionally firing back, but Eddie's return fire prevents him from aiming more carefully. Another aborigine points a revolver at him, but does not have time to shoot. Another shot from Travis saves the native. The sniper invites the young man to escape, but he shoots him in the stomach. He realizes that the shooter was here 12 years ago during the massacre. Eddie takes the wounded Travis to the outpost, where he is photographed. The colonel promises to fix him up before hanging him for murder. In the meantime, on the rock, Gutchuk and his grandfather prepare spearheads. The grandfather convinces him to abandon the road of vengeance, but a woman warrior appears in the evening. She tells her story, having been a servant in a similar outpost. When the girl complained to her family, the white men killed her entire family, and they let her go in circles. Now her path is one of hatred for whites, and she recommends that Gutchuk stay the course. Early in the morning they leave, leaving her grandfather alone. As a small detachment approaches the outpost, he is taken by surprise by the policeman stationed nearby. Letting them go in peace, the natives take their supplies, canned food, ammunition, horses, and weapons. As bait, the guy tells them to pour a box of ammunition into a fire. When they start to explode, Eddie and his men start rushing into the woods. Only the colonel's young nephew, who has never smelled powder, is left to guard Travis. The young warrior sneaks in and sets fire to the hulk of a makeshift church, the very heart of the Christian mission. The native takes aim at the colonel, forcing him and his nephew to drop their weapons. The wounded Travis appears next, and together with the rest of the prisoners they kneel down.
The native accuses the sniper of killing his family, but one awkward move results in the former soldier, even if wounded, taking his weapon from him. Strangely, Travis has no intention of killing Gutchuk. The old man points a revolver at the guy, forcing the sniper to fire. Meanwhile, Eddie realizes they're being distracted by the indiscriminate firing of stolen weapons and hops back. He fails in time to save his superiors, but knocks a former colleague to the ground. Dismounting, he points a revolver at Gutchuk. Another stalemate ensues as Eddie holds a gun on the native and the wounded warrior Travis holds a gun on Eddie. It ends with a sudden shot to the back. The girl kills Eddie to save the young man she has raised since she was young. As they embrace, the colonel's nephew jumps out and shoots. The bullet hits Travis in the chest, shielding Gutchuk. The former sniper dies in the arms of a certain rescued native and the priest's sister. Then, before the other policemen return, Gutchuk throws down his ammunition as the last yoke of civilization and mounts a horse with the female warrior. The two of them ride away, leaving behind them an angry camp and several corpses in the dust. The film ends with shots of a hawk disappearing into the sky and panoramas of Australia's lowlands, accompanied by national music.